Ahoy mates, Julie here. Welcome aboard Monday's edition of The Boaters TV. First up today, here's what's making a splash in nautical news. Russian President Vladimir Putin met with President Bush at the Bush family's Atlantic Coast compound in Kennebunkport, Maine early last week for what some are calling the Lobster Summit. The main topic of the debate was Putin's proposal for extensive Russian participation in an American missile defense shield, something Bush wasn't too hip on entertaining. To ease the tensions, Mr. George Bush Sr. took the leaders out on a 90-minute fishing trip aboard his speedboat Fidelity 3. And what do you know? The Russian president landed a striped bass. As for Team Bush, they caught nothing. In a gracious gesture to the less fortunate President Bush, Putin called the catch a team effort. Neither Bush seemed bothered, and the current president said it was, quote, very thoughtful of Putin to share credit for his angling success. The Bush family's bad luck on the water actually began the day before that, where on Sunday, when the president was out fishing with George Bush Sr. and daughter Barbara, their boat anchor got wedged in the rocks. Yeah, they dropped anchor to fish less than 100 feet from shore, but when they decided to leave, they couldn't. It was no problem, though. Divers aboard a Secret Service boat that had been following behind bailed them out by diving down and releasing the anchor. In the meantime, Bush kept fishing. Makes you wonder why the diver wasn't also deployed during the Putin outing, where he could have easily been used to hook a fish onto the president's line. But then again, that would be cheating. And speaking of wordsmiths, let's take a look at some nautical nomenclature in our ever-popular Did You Know segment. Did you know that the expression, the devil to pay, used to describe having a troublesome or unpleasant result from some action, as in, there'll be the devil to pay if you do that, has some relation to the nautical tradition. This expression, first recorded with its maritime meaning back in 1865, described one of the most dreaded tasks aboard a wooden ship. The devil was the wooden ship's longest seam in the hole. Now, during this time, the caulking of the seams between boards of the hole was done with pay, or pitch, a kind of tar. So, to pay the deck seams meant to seal them with tar. This task was considered to be a most difficult and unpleasant task indeed, and paying the devil was despised by pretty much every seaman. Now, the original use of the expression the devil to pay, dating back all the way to the year 1400, surely did mean a true bargain with the devil. But with the nautical definition I just gave you in mind, maybe this related expression will make more sense to you. If a sailor slipped on the deck, he could find himself between the devil and the deep blue sea. So, now you know. And next up, in Just for the Hull of It news, we'll look at not the devil, but rather the ducks and the deep blue sea. It used to be that Rubber Ducky was the one that made bath time so much fun. Now it looks like it'll be doing the same for beachcombers in the UK, as it could earn them a reward of somewhere between $100 and even up to $1,000. Because, according to an American oceanographer, a flotilla of plastic ducks is heading for Britain's beaches. Here's what happened. Back in 1992, a violent storm tossed containers carrying some 29,000 rubber bath toys, which in addition to the ducks included rubber frogs, beavers, and turtles, off the back of a cargo ship halfway between China and Seattle, and they were quickly presumed lost at sea. Instead, it appears, the castaways embarked on an epic swim across three oceans and halfway across the globe. For the last 15 years, oceanographers Curtis Ebesmeyer and James Ingram have tracked the ducks in an effort to better understand the behavior of surface currents. Every time a new duck is found, the two scientists plug data into an ocean surface current simulator, which has a program for tracking the drift of fish eggs that has been modified to predict where the ducks might end up next. Now, some of the remaining members of this armada of boat toys are expected to reach the next ports of call around southwest England, southern Ireland, and western Scotland after a journey of some 17,000 miles. And finally today, it's a new segment for us here at The Boaters TV as we bring to you Celebrities, a look at the marine world's movers and shakers. Now that the America's Cup is behind us, let's take a closer peek at the competitors. And no, I'm not talking about the Swiss team versus the Emirates team New Zealand, or even before the finals, the Swiss versus the Americans, but rather the battle of the billionaires. Ernesto Bertarelli versus Oracle CEO Larry Ellison. We're all aware by now that the America's Cup no longer carries much pretense of nationality. Yes, it's now all about big money, big business, and big egos. So, who is Ernesto Bertarelli? Suffices to say, he's one of the world's 100 richest men. His family made a fortune solving women's infertility problems. 
This Italian now lives in Switzerland, and just last year he sold off his company, Serrano, to Germany's Merck for $13.3 billion. And of course, Bertarelli is the owner of, and only Swiss crew member aboard, the winning boat Alini. Back in 2003, Bertarelli's Alini, an out-of-the-blue challenger from a landlocked country, became the only first-time entrant to win since the race's inception in 1851. The eccentric rules of the cup allow the winner of the trophy to stage the next challenge, and everything about it. So, with the help from fellow billionaire Oracle CEO Larry Ellison, the lead challenger in this year's cup, who wrote checks so that he could ride on his boat and compete with Ernesto, Bertarelli created America's Cup Management, which allowed the two men to team up and basically rewrite the nationality rules to make it easier for technology and talent to cross over to teams in this year's race. So we now know the outcome. Bertarelli gets to keep the most valuable sailing trophy the world over. Larry Ellison, on the other hand, always out to prove himself in a game of one-upmanship with his fellow billionaires, gets to complain all the way home. This used to be about sailing, now it's about megalomaniac egos. Thank goodness the world's two richest men, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, don't get into this child's play and instead donate their fortunes to charity. And that's a wrap on Monday's edition of The Boaters TV. We'll see you back here on Wednesday. Until then, take care. This episode of The Boaters TV was brought to you by the letter J. That's J for Julie, et, and meaning I'm on fire and have dangerous cargo on board. Keep well clear of me. <laughs>